Well, welcome everybody uh, to uh, uh, the Resilience Hub here at COP26 Glasgow. Uh, we've got a full room here in, uh, in, in Scotland and this is a big occasion. It's the first um, re Ensure Resilience event of COP, the first of many. It's also very exciting because it's an important meeting. It's the, it's the Climate and Disaster re uh, Finance and Insurance uh, roadmap of evidence, a critical document that many have been working on for the last two years to provide the critical information to allow us at long last to scale up uh, insurance and disaster risk finance in developed as well as developing countries. Um, I'm honoured to be standing next to uh, Dr. Maria Flachsbach, uh, State Secretary uh, in Germany, and I must say outgoing uh, Chair of the uh, Insure Resilience Global Partnership. Um, State Secretary, I've been a, a witness to the impact you've made in this domain over the last three years. It has been quite remarkable to think where we were uh, at COP three years ago and where we are. It's now no longer a question of should these techniques and principles be applied around the world, it's how. And I must say, uh, State Secretary, you've played a key role in that. So it's very uh, um, appropriate that you should give the first keynote here at the Resilience Hub at COP uh, for Ensure Resilience. Thank you. So thank you very much for this for this very warm and very very friendly words. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. So, distinguished guests, ladies and um, gentlemen, as the outgoing co-chair of the high-level consultative group of Intro Resilience Global Partnership, I'm really delighted to see so many of our valued partners uh, coming together at this event to strengthen our collective ambition and build on our success on climate disaster and risk finance and insurance. We are witnessing the impacts of climate change almost daily in our lives now. Between 2000 and 2019 worldwide economic losses from natural disasters amounted to 2.97 trillion US dollars where the majority of these events being weather and climate related. And while high income countries have so far accounted for most of the economic losses from purely a monetary point of view, human impact and relative loss in property and incomes are particularly severe in lower income countries. They are at the risk of losing hard-fought development gains and suffering under long-term disaster impacts on public finance, infrastructure and, of course, livelihoods. Since 2017, the global efforts to strengthen the resilience of poor and vulnerable people through risk financing approaches have been pooled under the Inter-Resilience Global Partnership. The partnership is based on a strong relationship and dialogue between industrialized and vulnerable communities and countries and includes non-state actors from civil society, academia, the private sector and international organizations, of course. The upscaling of climate and disaster risk finance and insurance, uh, CDRFI for short, is a cornerstone in making vulnerable communities and countries more resilient. And that is why Germany has so far committed some 800 million euros for the efforts of the INSU resilience. So let me make a quick look back at my time as co-chair of the partnership's high-level consultative group together. We have achieved remarkable success by adopting our vision 2025 in 2019, we put in place a strategic plan that is both ambitious and significant. Under this common vision, a strong pipeline of projects has grown. Our very active collaboration with the V20 and other vulnerable countries is reflected in more than 200 country level pro pro uh, projects with uh, many more to come. But our work on moving the CDRFI agenda forward also implies a task. We need to learn what works best and understand failure where we have not succeeded. 
the contexts and projects under the partnership are highly diverse and so are the challenges and lessons to be learned. For evidence-based policy decisions, we need a growing body of research and literature. When the Intro Resilience Initiative was launched at the G7 uh, summit in Elmau in 2015, GDRFI was a relatively new topic. An impressive amount of research has been undertaken since and the partnership has played a crucial role in collecting impact-related evidence. But so far, there has been no single format to coordinate future research and evidence gathering. So the evidence roadmap fulfills this purpose. It addresses the needs for collective evidence action. So I'm pleased to be here today for the launch of the Intro Resilience Evidence Roadmap. The evidence roadmap does a number of things. Firstly, it summarizes and prioritizes the most pressing questions of all aspects of CDRFI evidence based on a robust analysis of existing literature. What are the big open questions that need to be answered for improved impact on the ground? The evident roadmap lists and prioritizes 43 such questions to guide research and evidence work in the years to come. And secondly, the evident roadmap is highly participatory. It resulted from a collaborative process under the Intro Resilience Global Partnership with great support from the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative. So it benefits from the expertise of all Intro Resilience members and partners. It was authored by the CDRIF and community and for the CDRFI community, of course. Thirdly, the evidence roadmap sets out an implementation framework and set a joint action. Who is best suited to address with respect? What set of actions can we commit to collectively? And what role can the Intro Resilience Global Partnership play? The evidence roadmap answers these questions. It will complete the Intro Resilience Vision 2025 in setting out the milestones of our way to achieving a more resilient world by 2025 and achieving the goals of the Agenda 2030. That brings me to my last point. Today's launch marks a major milestone in itself. Yet, this is not the end of a journey. It is a starting point. The road described by the roadmap still lies ahead of us. And the implementation will be crucial for it to unfold this impact. For the roadmap to be implemented, actors need to step up their efforts and take leading roles in the implementation process. Let me emphasize that Germany is committed and will stay committed to playing a leading role in furthering the evidence agenda. Grounding development policy more systematically in research and evidence has also to be a cornerstone of my ministry's BMZ 2030 reform process. Together, we can succeed in pushing out the evidence frontier. That is why we expect all evidence work of a CDRFI programs we support to be inspired by and aligned with the priority of the evidence roadmap. Today, we brought together a great set of speakers and panelists from various inter-resilience stakeholder groups. Each of these groups has a role to play in furthering the evidence agenda in closing evidence gaps. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing our speakers' views on evidence roadmap and on the next steps suggested. So I will follow today's conversation with great interest. Excellencies and distinguished guests, before I close, I would like to take this opportunity at my last UNFCCC COP in my role as Parliamentary State Secretary of the BMZ to thank you all for the rewarding cooperation we have enjoyed over the past few years. It has been an honor for me to be part of this agenda and witness the fruits of our work. 
I wish you an insightful event, great changes and new inspirations for future activities. Thanks you all. Thank you very much. Dr. Fluxbus, thanks so much for um, outlining the role and, and purpose of, of the roadmap and uh, it, its genesis, but more, more particularly the role that we're all going to play uh, in ensuring it is, uh, it is delivered. Thank you also for committing uh, Germany's uh, ongoing support of this program. I think I speak for us all when I say it's BMZ and the German government that's really taken this agenda and driven the bus the last two or three years, and we're very glad uh, you'll still be uh, driving that bus. So thank you, Dr. Flaxbath. And now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Svenja Siminski, Head of Adaptation Research at the Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics, and also uh, the Chair of the uh, Munich Insurance Initiative. Uh, Svenja is going to take us through uh, the roadmap, uh, show us the directions, and uh, allow us all to then jump on the bus. Svenja, great to see you here in Glasgow, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rowan. It sounds like, you know, very traffic-themed introduction, you know, roadmap, bus. Well, let's see where we're going. Let's see where the journey heads. So um, I'm very happy to be here. I have to say, over the last two years, I'm more used to sitting in my quiet office, looking at a screen and giving online presentations. So this feels amazing, very exciting, but I'm also a little bit nervous about where to look and, you know, not seeing all the people online. So I hope we can make this a hybrid experience. Well, what works and when and where? What doesn't work and why does it not work? I mean, these are really key questions for anyone who wants to make progress and who wants to see innovation. And particular when it comes to resolving difficult challenges. And I don't think we need any reminder about the difficult challenges that lay ahead. So I think we just need to keep that in mind. At the core, you know, this is about making sure that those who are most vulnerable are supported, that tools meet their needs, that we enhance resilience in a smart way, in a long-lasting way, and that we do not end with quick fixes that will fail at the first hurdle. So in this context, I'm very happy to introduce this important report that colleagues at the Insure Resilience Global Partnership, in collaboration with MCII and with many other experts, have worked on over the last, well, month, in fact, years. I mean, this dates back for quite a while. And I'm really pleased because this is close to my heart. You know, achieving innovation through learning. And I, although the title is slightly the other way around. I think it is important, you know, learning is everywhere and we need to learn what works, but also what doesn't work. And, you know, last year, I think we started to look at existing monitoring and valuation. What's actually out there? What do we know? And I think a key point is to remember what does success means. And if I would ask you here in the room, what is success when it comes to climate and disaster risk financing initiatives? You know, I might actually get very different responses depending on your background, your context, your community you're representing. And that's an important starting point. So actually success criteria for this are very diverse. And I think this is where, you know, we are kind of reaching a, cr a junction because there is a lot of, you know, pace for innovation, growing numbers of tools. I mean, here you see, I think if we could move, I don't know who's moving the slides. I'm moving the slides here on my laptop, but that doesn't seem to have any impact. <laughs> see, I warned you, there might be some hiccups with hybrid working. So we are actually seeing, you know, real sort of push for innovation. And if you just look at this slide here, you know, that map is growing. You know, there are a number of innov innovation initiatives, pilots, new schemes being developed. But at the same time, you know, we also see this mobilization of funding. So there is finally a lot of capital being available to go into this important area to actually develop tools that include insurance and disaster risk financing. And I think this also creates an obligation to actually not just think about scale, 
but also the quality of what it is. What are the types of products? What are the solutions? And do they actually work? If we move to the next slide, please. So at the core of this evidence roadmap is really you know, this quest for evidence. And you know, this is a question of looking at different levels. So what are the local needs? Are they, are they being met? Do we understand what the impacts on individuals, on you know, smallholders, on farmers, or also on governments are? Do we understand that? Do we track that? And do we share that information? And I think here, you know, the ambition is really to, um, to send a signal out to anybody who is working in this space that we need to actually have a proper approach to monitor, evaluate, but also to, to have accountability and learning. And until recently, I wasn't quite sure what the acronym MEAL means. Anybody who's seen the roadmap might have come across that acronym. I thought it might be a sort of MEAL deal, but no, it stands for Monitoring, Evaluation, Accountability, and learning. And I think that's a really important part here. So the idea is to bring together evidence and to use that evidence and to learn from that evidence. And evidence comes in very different forms. It is evidence from the local level, evidence from researchers, evidence from funders, but it is all about better understanding of what works, how these things work, and how we can actually bring them to scale. And that's what this roadmap um, tries to do. Next slide, please. So if you have a look at the roadmap, it's organized along six themes. Um, they're very small print here, so you can't really read them. So it's people and climate-focused perspectives, national and public sector perspectives, global risk financing action, gender dimensions, risk information analysis and resilient outcomes. And these are sort of core themes. And for each of those, um, in the roadmap, there are a set of criteria. It's, it's a guidance to better understand, if you look at a certain tool, an instrument, a scheme, to better understand of, you know, what does it actually do? You know, what does it deliver under these six evidence themes? And do we have evidence of quick impacts, what are the persistent questions? And is there also evidence for more transformational, longer-term change? And that's the, the sort of framework, if you like. Next slide, please. So the roadmap really gives a framework for anybody who works in this space. And it sets out norms, actions, and investments. And it sort of tries to actually send out a new sort of impetus um, for better evidence gathering, ideally at the onset, not only once you've put a scheme in place, but at the beginning, but then also sharing those lessons and those insights. And I think this is very much in the spirit of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership to actually bring together the community and not just, you know, share the good stories, but also learn from some challenges and, and together address how to overcome that. So the evidence framework is really a sort of toolkit that you can work on and that should be applied. And with it come certain commitments to sort of look for these different aspects and follow these different norms, have actions that go with it, and make investments that support that. Next slide. So I mentioned these six themes. And just to give you a bit of a feel for there are some key questions, and I think they actually map out the way forward in terms of going deeper into you know, what's happening on the ground, what do we know about these products and tools, what they actually do in terms of benefits, do they work, but also mapping out where we are heading and where opportunities are to bring CDRFI to bigger scale. And here are some of the questions listed, and I think in the panel discussions we can hopefully do a bit of a deep dive because we have some of the colleagues who actually were working on these def different segments here to go a little bit deeper. But I think the key I want to leave you here is, you know, this is not just a question of looking for gaps 
It's also for basically sharing information. And I've been working in this space for a long time. And, you know, I, as a researcher, you know, you always complain about information not being shared. But I think as a practitioner and as someone who actually works on the ground, but also who, who funds initiatives, who designs them, it is really important to have access to evidence, but at the same time also understand you know, the limitations, understand where the challenges are. And I think that's very much the spirit of the roadmap. Next slide. So just a couple of other examples here. And I just wanted to home in on the resilience outcome one, because we kind of always assume that you know, in this space, of course, all we do is deliver resilience. But what is it? I mean, you know, it is a really difficult concept. And resilience means different things to different people. So it's really important to actually also consider how these instruments are being experienced by those who are supposed to benefit from it. And also to avoid maladaptation. And as I said earlier, to avoid quick fix solutions that might create a false sense of security, but in the long term have no chance of actually being sustainable on or you know, developing further or being scaled up. Next slide. So, you know, this is really an important moment because, you know, over the last couple of years, you know, we've seen this increase in activities, initiatives, but at the same time, we've also seen, um, yeah, sort of a growing understanding of some of the challenges, but limitations in terms of really having a clear framework and also clear guide when it comes to tracking, to monitoring, to evaluating, and then also to, to scaling up. And I think this is very much the spirit of this evidence roadmap. And you know, it, it creates obligations, if you like, for different actors. And I think that's very much you know, also a call to action for anybody involved in this, not to just see this as a nice to have document that will end up on somebody's shelf. No, instead, it's a really good starting point, I think. Um, to move to a better understanding, but eventually better solutions that then have that long-lasting impact. And I think, you know, this is the spirit. It's a community project with very much different sort of perspectives being covered. And I think that's, that's the only way forward in this area. And I'm very excited that we have this document out now. I'm also excited to see some close colleagues and good friends here being on the panel. And I would like to congratulate all those who were involved in developing that document. And I would encourage everybody to take a look. Um, I've not given it justice at all. I've just given you a bit of a taster. But hopefully, this will raise some interesting questions for the discussion. And with that, I'll hand over to our able moderator, who I'm sure will lead us to some good, challenging questions. Thank you. Svenja, don't go too far because we'll be asking you some questions, I'm sure, but we're now going to uh, uh, move to the panel session. And uh, it's going to be a hybrid panel session. I'm going to ask uh, our, our speakers here in the room, uh, uh, so uh, Sophie and Henke, to uh, take their chairs on the... Uh, uh, on the uh, so uh, Sonka and Sophie, I think you're... Whichever ones you like. That's right. Now we're going to uh, enter the uh, the technically brave uh, part of the uh, of the show, and we've got uh, um, two two of our panelists are speaking online. So uh, Anne, Anne Anne Vaughan from from USAID, uh, are you able to hear us? Hear me? Anne, can you can you hear us? Okay. I can hear you. Can you I'm hear me? I'm not sure that we can hear you in the room yet. Um, Oh, I, I can hear and you. Shoot. Hold on one Sorry, while everyone's online, we're just uh, checking some technology here. While we're, while we're just checking if Anne can uh, be heard here in the room, I just want to see if uh, Vasitha's on the line. Vasitha the Winyaki? Vasitha, are you there? Hello. Uh, I am. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, loud and clear. It's great to have you with us, Vasitha, from, uh, from SICAN, also, of course, a, a high-level uh, member of the Ensure Resilience uh, Partnership and chairing the, uh, the, the IMPACT program. 
Um, and uh, it'd be great to get your perspective. So we can hear you loud and clear. I'm just going to ask if we can hear Anne Vaughan from USAID. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, oh. Anne, we can. Oh, good. It, that's okay, cool. great. It's great to have you on the line. And uh, if I could ask you and Vasitha to speak quite loudly, because actually in the room here in, uh, in Glasgow, there's quite a lot of background noise from all the other things going on. So if I can ask you to speak uh, quite, quite loudly. We can hear Sophie and uh, Honka, I'm sure. Uh, can, can we just test your microphones, make sure everything's working? No, not yet. You need, you need the green. That was my mistake. I mean, Sonka, can we hear you? I, and mine's working. Oh, that's okay. quite loud. Is that all right? So, Sonka, uh, give it a shot. Working? That's yeah, it, we're I on. Okay. Cool. All righty. Um, Anne, I'm going to come to you, if I may, first. It's, it's absolutely wonderful to uh, have USAID uh, moving more into this area. And in your position, uh, leading uh, uh, climate uh, adaptation and resilience, it would be very interesting to hear which perhaps of those six pillars that uh, Swenya mentioned in the report, which of those perhaps resonated most strongly uh, for, for you, Anne? Great, thanks. Just double checking, you can still hear me? We can hear you and we can see you as well. All coming great. through. Okay, great. Then I will, all right, sorry, it's a little awkward. I can't see you. I just see a big sign that says studio feed, but it's oh. so great to be here. Um, USAID, we're extremely excited to be uh, uh, part of IGP now, um, and great to hear Swenya's voice and get to see her and other friends from, from IGP who are doing such fantastic work in this space. Uh, before having to respond to your, your, your kind of tough, mean question of making me uh, respond to just one of the, which pillar is our favorite, um, I, I just wanted to quickly give great appreciation and, and thanks both to IGP for convening the panel and a really hearty congratulations to the authors of the report. Um, it's really well done uh, and impressive to see the amount of, I think, thoughtfulness and introspection that the community is doing and looking into what are the problems, what are the gaps, and how do we find solutions so we're making sure we have a real impact. So just uh, appreciation for the thought, um, the thoughtfulness that have gone into to this process and into the roadmap. Um, and again, I know I'm, I'm unhappy to have to choose between any of the six pillars, as, as frankly, I think they're all quite important. Um, I note that USAID is uh, releasing our climate change strategy for public comment at COP in uh, a couple days. Uh, and I think we're looking holistically about how the whole agency, all of USAID, um, can increase our climate ambition and think that all six of those pillars will be helpful for us um, as we uh, go forward and make sure we're um, reaching the moment and being as ambitious as possible in our climate uh, and, uh, climate actions. Um, and I just say a special appreciation for the, the gender pillar, I think will be of interest. But if you force me to choose between one of the six, I think I'd have to go with um, the, the people and client focused perspective pillar. USAID is focused on, on locally led solutions to locally identified key risks, priorities and opportunities. Our administrator, administrator power feels very strongly about elevating locally led solutions and from our work on the ground, we know that that's, that's what works is if we put the, the decisions, thoughts, and, and actions in the hands of local people um, and government. So uh, I think I'd flag the ARC group uh, is a perfect example of an African Union-led effort that gives African countries and communities the tools, the assistance, and the support to purchase disaster risk insurance at the sovereign and now also the micro level too, which we're excited about. I think efforts to offer insurance literacy and learning to those governments and other stakeholders is also a priority for USAID. So look forward to suggestions through the evidence process from, from the, the, the roadmap and, and future learnings. Um, and we're excited that we're partnering with a financial resilience program at the World Bank, which aims to address a lot of these um, uh, insurance literacy and learning for government issues. Um, We've seen workshops between various stakeholders in Kenya have helped lead to the successful establishment of the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program that's been assisted by USAID and funded by the Agriculture Insurance Development Program that's also at the World Bank have real impact uh, when you focus on um, the insurance literacy aspects. And we're looking forward to seeing how IGP partners can continue to focus on the benefits and impacts down at the household and community level um, which is really what we're trying to do with disaster risk financing tools. Um, and so we're, we're excited to, to dig more into the, the 
um, the, the roadmap. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to, I want to try to answer your question, just stick to one pillar. But again, appreciation for all the work that's gone into um, the report. Over. Uh, and thank you so much. And uh, no, I certainly didn't want to, to, to narrow your focus of the question. It was great to get your, your broader perspective. Uh, and uh, I think some of your priorities will resonate uh, with, with many people. But uh, it's really first among equals amongst the six pillars. Uh, I'm going to come to Sunka now, if I may, Executive Director of the uh, Munich Climate and Insurance uh, Initiative. Um, thank you for being the, the, the uh, facility to produce this remarkable report. Um, Perhaps like Anne, I'm going to ask you a more general question about your, your views on this strategically as a document, as a piece of work, and where it, where, it, uh, where, it, where it is likely to head both the MCII, but broadly how you see this being implemented. As, uh, as Swenia said, this isn't going to just sit on, uh, sit on shelves. The timing could not be better. So paint a picture for the, for the road ahead, but also perhaps uh, how, how this was conceived and developed at MCII. Um, OK, yeah. The chair is slightly unstable, so I hope <laughs> <laughs> I'm not falling off. So um, yeah, uh, thank you, Rowan, for um, this introduction. I think maybe um, first I want to um, take you through the journey on arriving that document. Mm. This is not an MCI document by any means. Um, I'm co-chairing the Impact Working Group of Inter Resilience, and if you look at um, the Vision 2025, um, there. Um, the role of evidence is, is, is captured there. But the question is, how can this be implemented uh, in the real world? Uh, what is our pathway to impact it? And I think that's where the strategic roadmap um, comes into play. Um, so we, uh, we, we very much developed it um, as a community um, document. Uh, we had a joint workshop with, I think, more than 100, 150 participants last year to actually set the agenda, talk about uh, um, the notion of evidence and why it is important. We have seen a an burst of new initiatives, but we also um, saw that it's probably not like accompanied by the honest learning that the community really needs. And so we had this workshop and we had several rounds of the impact working group. So um, that group um, consists of implementing partners of the Insurance Global Partnership, but also academic partners uh, and comes together every two months. And so we had, did a, a specific workshop there. We also looked for, for lead authors on the thematic pillars. These are really author driven. Um, and these authors themselves also did consultations with the community, with actors. Um, but we also discussed uh, the jo um, joint way forward. What does it mean to our work? Does, what does it mean to individual actors? Uh, what does it mean to the collective? And um, so um, if you look at the document itself, this is not written by these parts are not written by any author. Um, these are actually consulted with everyone. Everyone had the chance to do line by line commenting. Um, and so the expectation is quite clear that what you see under the evidence framework, under the joint action is actually a community outcome and it's an expectation to the community to be implemented. If I go um, through the different categories, um, you see um, there are evidence norms. This really speaks to each and every player. Um, what do we need for honest learning? Um, for example, uh, something very concrete um, to take out of that uh, uh, part of the framework is that 5% of programming costs should go to uh, M&E and to learning. And I think that's a very concrete outcome, at least 5% of programming costs. But there are also other concrete norms. For example, the spirit to share data. Um, and I'm not um, talking about necessarily uh, project indicators, but also like success uh, data um, and also share that uh, beyond your uh, own grouping, but also, for example, with academics, because we need this kind of triangular cooperation between implementers and academics. So this is one category called evidence norms. Then we also um, identified specific actions that are required. For example, for different stakeholder groups to come together, we need the academic for uh, scientific rigor and uh, methodological innovations. We need, for example, the private sector to embrace the topic of evidence strategically because it improves products over time and makes them sustainable. We need governments to um, commit to evidence-based policy making. We need civil society uh, also um, to, uh, for example, 
do advocacy, uh, evidence-based, and we of course need the implementers that really truly need to make a paradigm shift when it comes to, to evidence. So bringing them together also requires something like of a joint language. So this is also specific action. And then of course everything uh, needs to be resourced. Um, so for example, academic actors, um, um, science is a public good. Usually um, um, there are um, scientific um, funding calls we are actually advocating for a CDFI evidence funding call geared to um, academic stakeholders, um, but at the same time also setting the right incentives. Um, we cannot allow this to go into the ivory tower of academia. Uh, it actually needs to encourage uh, hybrid implementation science projects uh, in the future. So this is something very concrete um, um, coming out. Uh, maybe I stop there and I'll pick up, up uh, other pieces afterwards. Oh, th th thank feedback. you so much, Sonka. And, and I'm uh, t talking about k keeping it out of the ivory towers. I'm going to go to uh, v Vasitha now. Uh, Vasitha, I, I, I think you're speaking from Sri Lanka, but um, with your... No, uh, <laughs> I'm getting not... She speaks from Glasgow. <laughs> from Glasgow. Okay, but just not here in this room right now. Well, hopefully the yes. line will be uh, e e even better then. So uh, Vasitha, would love to get your perspective because with your legal background, you sit here at COP as a negotiator, as well as your role in IGRP. would love to get your sense of how this does move forward practically from your own perspectives in Sri Lanka. Yeah, so um, sorry about not being able to be there in person. I did a few rounds last go and, and then made it back to where I, I stayed. Um, so, I, I'm also speaking in my personal capacity so that it doesn't get confused um, as to which position I'm sharing. Um, in, in, in looking at how um, Sri Lanka has been working on climate disaster, um, climate and disaster risk transfer, and also how evidence uh, roadmap and the work that we're doing on these things, uh, I think it's important to understand that developing countries do need support and also um, it's important to understand that developing countries have been making their own efforts for years. Um, so for example, Sri Lanka is probably one of the countries that has the oldest climate and disaster risk transfer insurance scheme that's there because we've been having it since 1950s. Um, and this is all through the national budget. And, and then we need to see how this is impacting the capacities and the resilience of the communities that are at the forefront of climate and disaster risks. Um, so there's a, there's a role that we need to understand as um, developing countries for us to play, as well as other countries and other actors, like the investors, the funders, um, and also the developed countries, um, need to take into account that while the countries are vulnerable, they also have this rich capacity and resilience that could be shared. Uh, for example, Sri Lanka's um, case study could be an example of how things could happen, despite the fact that there is no investment that comes from external uh, sources at, at the larger scale to function for years. Um, so we have the livestock sector insurance schemes that are there, the agriculture insurance schemes, as well as uh, it's been looked at how the SME sector could also have um, a component of, um, uh, regarding the insurance. Um, so civil society, multiple actors have a big role to play in the last few years with the IGP also this has been seen. Um, so we have some activities that we're doing in Sri Lanka as part of a larger project as well. So the evidence that's gathered from multiple actors from the ground needs to be shared uh, so that these could be replicated plus feed into evidence frameworks like the one that we are talking about today. Um, I hope I answered the question, but I'll come back to uh, more details uh, if you have anything follow up. Thanks. Uh, no, thanks so much, Vizitha, um, very much indeed. And, uh, and now I come to uh, Sophie Evans, uh, Head of Country Programs at the um, Centre for Disaster Protection uh, based in London, um, a, a centre that's well known for producing significant evidence itself. And I'd really like to uh, ask you, Sophie, how does the roadmap, you think, complement the sort of work and evidence that uh, uh, the centre has been uh, undertaking and, and will undertake, but also from your own perspective uh, of the country program direction, where is this roadmap going to help you uh, in, in, your, uh, in your global quest? Thank you, and I must say, a bit like Swenya, it is very weird being up here, so I'm sorry if there's lots of ums and ahs 
I'm used to having my script in front of me um, on a split screen on a Zoom call. So um, it's wonderful to, see, to be here. And thank you so much for the kind invitation to speak. Sorry for the feedback. Um, so I guess on your, on your first point there, Rowan, I think it's a, a brilliant roadmap. And I think it was incredibly well presented. And I know it's hours of consultation and engagement. And I think it it's, can truly be held up as an inclusive document. And I think that's a really important point to acknowledge. And I know something that the IGP actually work incredibly hard on. Um, it's also excellent timing as the centre enters into its second phase and looks to make a substantial contribution to the roadmap as well. So um, it's worked out perfectly for us. Thank you. Um, so I guess there's two priorities as we see it from our side that could complement the roadmap or, or maybe work alongside. The first being about evidence that really truly supports and provides the case for disastrous financing, a CDRFI, for the poor and the vulnerable. So I think um, of the work that we've done and the evidence gap reviews that we've done to date, there isn't a huge amount of evidence there that links CDRFI um, efforts and anticipation to genuinely you know, alleviating poverty and working for those most marginalized in society. And I think, I think the remarks from everybody involved today and everything we've heard, that's a, a, clear, a clear commitment. And I think that's something that's really, really important and something that we'll be taking forwards as well. Um, I can think of maybe three rigorous evidence programs. I think Mexico Fonden did a, a really substantial one. ARC came up um, and mentioned, and also some work in Bangladesh on anticipatory action, um, which all contributes to kind of the pre-agreed financing and making sure the evidence outcomes uh, really do contribute to, to the poor and vulnerable objectives that we, that we also work to serve. So we will be funding um, those programs, so please get in touch. Um, we'll be looking to support um, that uh, sort of impact analysis and great to hear how you've broken it down between academia and practitioner as well because I think that's a really important nexus that we um, need to consider and then in terms of the work that we've done to date so the second point for us is around a priority is that we've done quite a lot of analysis on COVID financing and understanding where the money is flowing um, a piece of work that we brought out I think earlier this year although time seems to be a bit of a warp um, last year as well, it's, it's been updated, is around 2% of the funding for COVID was pre-agreed in advance, despite the fact that we know that a, a pandemic is, is, was highly likely, if not predictable or definitely foreseeable. Um, and so while we were analysing that 2% of pre-agreed financing, of which disastrous financing instruments um, and financing solutions are part of it, we're not actually thinking about the other 98% of financing that goes for disasters and crises. Um, so we're going to be looking at that other 98% to understand what uh, interventions we can make, both from an evidence perspective, but also from a practitioner and implementation perspective, to be able to really change um, change the system so that we get even more pre-agreed financing in place for um, resilience objectives, as I sit here in the Resilience Hub, but also for you know planned risk reduction and everything else that goes with it. So those are kind of the, the, the two parts um, to where we're going. Um, on my vast experience, <laughs> uh, experience in country programs, for us, it, I think it needs to be a bit of a nexus between um, evidence that supports implementation, program design, solution design, um, an easy one is um, drought probably impacts the world most uh, from a poverty perspective. Is that the primary risk that we're designing the financial solution for? Are we aligning that financial solution to the needs of the poor and the vulnerable? Do we know what those needs are? Um, and is that being an inclusive process? Now, evidence is a huge part of, of the design work as we see it from a financial solution side. But it's also an enormous part of, as everybody's been talking about today, about knowing if our work's any good. So uh, our evaluation um, and our, our meal approaches, we've actually been experimenting with some process evaluation that's been going very well with our colleagues at OCHA on their um, anticipatory action pilots. And that's kind of real-time evidence, which we've been really, uh, really fascinating to learn the results of. So these are just a few insights from us. Thank you. Sophie, thanks uh, so much for that. And I think it, it's, it's very... Uh, exciting to to feel the alignment between the different institutions and players in the room. Um, I remember when Ensure Resilience published Vision 2025, and it acted and with its targets um, way back three or four, four or five years ago, and that's acted as a focal point for all of us, whether they're in the private sector or the public sector, academic sector. Uh, and of course, uh, the targets keep rising, which is, which is good. But actually what this roadmap is going to be really focusing on is, is the implementation 
pathway and the implementation modalities based on all that we've learned. And many in this room have done many great things, but now we all want to scale up. And I can see that this roadmap is going to be the vehicle, not just to point us in the right direction, but for us to coordinate and cooperate in a new uh, and even more significant way. So um, we're going to transition now to some hybrid uh, questions and answers. Um, I can see in the audience we've got people who I'm sure will have questions. If you don't, I will pick on some people I know, so be warned. But I think we're also going to have uh, some questions from our audience uh, around the world. So um, if we have any questions coming in online, if, uh, if we could get those uh, here to the front. But uh, I'll start inside the room um, with uh, any questions here in Glasgow. We have some online. Well, thank you, audience <laughs> online. The audience here are a wee bit shy, um, but uh, we, will, we will break the shyness. But thank you online. Over to you, okay. Sonke. Um, yeah, um, so there was a question um, asking uh, whether there's a repository or center sharing hub for M&E or climate insurance practitioners to share lessons learned, best practices, um, etc. I think it's actually a question that goes to me, so we don't <laughs> need you as a moderator. Um, uh, no, we also discussed it as part of the impact working group on what are the next steps for the working group itself. Um, so uh, Insure Resilience created a knowledge hub um, and the document itself is shared there. But for us, it's also important to track progress that is happening in response to the evidence roadmap. And so we are in discussion with the secretariat whether it's possible to also track some of the concrete commitments and work that is now done, as we just heard, uh, for example, by the center, uh, and also uh, make it speak um, to um, the, the, the commitments and expectations that are set out by the roadmap. So stay tuned. We haven't figured out exactly on how to do it, but this will definitely be on the agenda for the working group, and we'll, I think we, uh, I'm positive that we'll get like some sort of a, a, a knowledge sharing arrangement through the working group. Thank you so much, Sonka. Ah, I see, I think, a question in the room. T Tuga, we might need to give you a microphone. Here we go. It's on. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Tuga from the Insure Resilience Secretariat, and I just want to add to the answer that just came in from Sonka. One of the other big areas that we've identified as having a gap is our understanding of the impact of climate disasters, finance, and insurance on gender. And so another thing that we've brought to COP, um, which will be launched next week, is the Center of Excellence um, on Gender Smart Solutions, which is an online repository of information that will bring together all the knowledge that uh, members of our partnership have, and, and will also identify gaps in our knowledge in understanding the intersection between gender and climate disasters financing. So please do visit our Center of Excellence. Please do give us feedback on it. We want to make sure that it actually does fill the information gaps and does support the work that you are doing. And please join us next Tuesday um, at 4 o'clock UK time for the launch of the Center of Excellence at the Canadian Pavilion if you're at COP or um, watch our Twitter space for uh, the virtual dial-in. Um, but it's a very good question. And as Sanka says, more broadly, there is a need to bring this knowledge for the evidence roadmap. And we will be looking at the most appropriate way to do this. Thank you. Tuga, thanks so much for raising that uh, really important point. And we'll be there. Was it next Tuesday? Yes. Next Tuesday it is. Any more questions here in the room? We'll come. swenya has got a question. Now, that, now, now we're all nervous. When a lead author of the report asks questions, we get. No, I'm not a lead, lead author. Off. That's why I can ask oh, okay, a challenging question. <laughs> um, I think. You know, obviously, it's great that there's now also a focus on the quality of these instruments because, you know, for a long time, it was more focused on quantity and now we need to understand the quality. But playing devil's advocate, I mean, you know, on one hand, we're also running out of time because, you know, the, the, the risk and the urgency increases. And here we are still discussing, you know, ga gathering facts and collecting evidence and designing solutions. So how do we, how do we bring the, ur the urgency and the needs and the demand together with this? Because you could say, is it still that we don't know? Or is it work in progress? Or how would you describe this? It might be a question for Anne as well, yes. from a donor uh, let, perspective. Let's come on. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Anne, would you like to come in here? 
in terms of basically how can we act faster and, uh, and more significantly? Well, good, good question. Um, thanks, Swenya. Um, I'd have to so we just put the White House uh, has just put out a press release for uh, the president's sort of remarks and, and I would say deliverables at, uh, for COP26. And I'd highlight the first one is called PREPARE, which uh, stands for the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience. And I think that efforts like that, which will bring a whole of government approach to um, addressing the increasing impacts of, of climate change um, and helping elevate adaptation is one of the solutions to your, or one of the steps we need to take um, to make sure we're acting with urgency and quickly um, to respond and, and move forward with overall resilience building efforts. And then within this prepare effort, I think there's some exciting um, uh, work to be done on elevating uh, uh, evidence-based interventions. So I just want U.S. government example on how uh, we're bringing to the table some of that sense of urgency to move forward and really um, help advance the donor community conversations and also partnering with our, our um, uh, other governments to make sure within uh, our, our programming partnerships and what we fund is, is very evidence-based. So again, I think we just, we can lean on um, uh, your, the the um, the roadmap for sort of what the gaps are. Let's fill those gaps, so we make sure we're funding what's most effective. So it's even with um, the push for increased funding for uh, climate action, um, there's still we still need to do more with what we have. So we need to make sure it's being funded effectively. Um, so looking forward to digging into what those specifics are. Um, in, in different programs and across different sectors. Um, so we just flagged that, but uh, Sonia, you set me up very nicely to talk about what something's just hot off the presses when it comes to US government interventions and elevation of adaptation and resilience. And I'll, I'll drop um, the fact sheet into the chat if folks have uh, want to dig in a little bit more uh, into, into this uh, new effort by the USG, over. And thank you so much. And you raise a really interesting point actually, because as resilience becomes more of a challenge, even more of a challenge in developed countries and policy within the United States, within Germany after these years events. Of course, here in the UK, not, not least with the challenges many have had actually to arrive here in COP because uh, uh, our, our trains are broken down through, through floods. Maybe as our domestic policies in some developed countries prioritize resilience, that will also amplify what happens within the uh, development sector. I think that many of the lessons that have been learned in um, innovative programs in disaster risk financing uh, in the global south, that innovation is actually going to be imported back into the UK, into Germany, into the US and Canada. It's very exciting. This is very much a two-way uh, flow. So it's a roadmap that we can all share in our variety of roles. Um, uh, I think we've got time for one more question, and I may think there might be a few online. So over to you, Sonka. Okay, I'm the point of contact, I guess. No, um, uh, one question asked by uh, the online audience is, what are the major challenges uh, you see while building evidence uh, in the CDI space, specifically in low-income countries? Uh, yeah. I think we slightly had a bit of a challenge hearing that. Was that the, okay. could you just say it a wee Sorry. bit more loud, loudly? Thanks. So what are the major challenges you see while building evidence uh, in the CDFI space, especially in low income countries? Um, how do we see this uh, taking on? Uh, Vasitha, could I, could I come to you on that one? Uh, because I think your perspective, both uh, within Sri Lanka, but more broadly, would be, uh, would be very valuable. For, for you, within Sri Lanka, or with your what, wider perspectives, what are the, the critical evidence gaps that are the hardest to crack in, in the field? Um, yeah, so um, talking about low-income countries, so it's like interest works in least developed countries as well, working on national adaptation plans and resilience building. And in, in looking at what was a key challenge in the work that we did was data, uh, which was um, reliable and also long-term because for risk mapping and all, um, long-term data is necessary, but most countries have a gap in this. And then also looking at gender-based perspectives, there's almost, um, I, I think, never that you have long-term data which are gender disaggregated. So 
Uh, one challenge would be that. And then there's also the capacity needs uh, that are available or existing, uh, as well as the institutional structures that would be needed. Uh, and then finance for investments to engage in these activities is very important. So uh, while we have a knowledge base that is indigenous or um, in the country and country driven processes that could be built on, it's important that there's um, technical support, capacity building, financial support uh, for these countries to work, um, to scale up the existing processes. Um, because sometimes it's important to see what's out there uh, as those that are available as sources and information, as well as evidence uh, to replicate something and also adapt the systems which are best suited for the countries that we are using. Uh, because um, most of the things that are out there won't be replicable in the same way in a country that's still developing country. So we need to identify the indicators uh, and the things that are vital for the country's business building, the sectors. Um, uh, so, for example, if you're looking at Sri Lanka, we're looking at food systems as a priority, but while now we're looking at also the entrepreneurship angle and the SMEs as a priority. So, with the time scale changes, how things need to adapt is something we need to look at. And, um, and I think what we did well in the impact working group is that we looked at the terminology as well as the language that would help to bridge what happens in the developing countries as well as the developed countries. because. When you're talking the same language, the evidence actions could be scaled up in a better way and be better understood uh, than get lost in the language mix up and uh, misunderstanding the concepts we are talking about. It's not about speaking English. I'm talking about the technological aspect of how we do things with the language that we understand in science. And this needs to be communicated in local languages. And it's, it's, it's a big thing that we faced when we're talking to farmers. Um, or even fishing communities and also people who are um, not comprehending what climate risk transfer is. So we need to be able to communicate in a language that people understand. So that's a challenge that exists as well. So thank you. Oh, Vasitha, you've, you've uh, highlighted such an important point uh, in, the, in those, uh, those interventions, particularly the one on, on communication and language. Uh, um, thank you. Sonka, I'm going to have one more online question. So pick your finest. From the, uh, from the great list you have in front of you. Also the only one. Good. <laughs> so, um, the question is, um, how can we ensure insurance is available and accessible for communities residing in urban areas exposed to physical climate change hazards, so specifically uh, urban insurance? Sure. Sophie, I'm going to come to you with that one. Uh, sure. Um, a nice easy one to finish on. Thank you very much. So um, at the Centre for Disaster Protection, we, um, many of us have worked in insurance before, myself included, but I think we take a slightly broader view about thinking about pre-agreed financing, so it doesn't have to be explicit uh, insurance products that interface necessarily with the private market, but thinking more about reliable, predictable, timely financing for certain shocks, so where um, Typical market barriers uh, may exist in terms of kind of home insurance, if you're living on a floodplain, those sorts of things. What are the other social structures and social contracts that we can have to support fin read readily, readily available financing for shocks and crises? So examples like social protection mechanisms um, that can scale to support the communities in, as the crisis hits, or even in advance in many cases. Um, so for us, it's taking a slightly broader view um, beyond just straight insurance, as we many of us think about it. Um, and trying to support through a number of different systems and mechanisms. So it's not just, uh, it may be from the government, maybe through mutual funds, it may be bottom up or top down, and thinking more laterally about rather than just technical solutions and more inclusive solutions. Uh, I also want to give an answer on this one um, because it actually uh, shows the value of the um, CDIFI roadmap. Um, if you look at the resilience outcome chapter, this is actually identified as one of the, the quick impacts. I think the evidence we are seeing, especially robust evidence in academic journals, is tilted to kind of the rural setup, uh, the agriculture setup. Um, and so this is also a call, a specific uh, thematic call as part of the, the document um, to also uh, launch uh, specific research in this area. So thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Sanka. Okay, I think we'll move to, uh, uh, unless there's any final questions in the room. Going, going, gone. Okay, we're gonna have just a round of final, uh, final words from, from the panelists. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna come uh, to Anne, if I may. Any, any final uh, thoughts you'd like to share uh, with, uh, with, with us all 
uh, before we bring uh, the session to an end, Anne. Sure. No, just very quickly, appreciation, good questions from the audience. And again, appreciation for um, the roadmap and how we make sure that all the work that's gone into this, um, the evidence that's going to come out of it and the gaps that we're going to fill that we implement, and we implement it at scale um, because we have a, a huge challenge in front of us and need to make sure that we're leveraging all of the best evidence to really um, have impact and help the communities on the ground that are most impacted by climate change. So looking forward to working with you all um, and continue partnership with IGP and others on the panel to, to keep, uh, to keep the, 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 the work going. So thank you very much. Over. Uh, and we all look forward to, uh, to working with you and the, and the team too. Uh, Vasitha, I wonder if I could come to you now and uh, we look forward to seeing you in and around Glasgow in the coming, uh, in the coming days. But any final thoughts for this, uh, this session? Yeah, um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, um, to everyone who are, well, who I can't see, but, um, and also the great work uh, that everyone put in to get this evidence roadmap uh, to become a reality. Um, and I, I just want to add something. I think going forward, when you're looking at actions and evidence and norms and investments, all this, I think we also need to look at uh, youth as a group that we need to focus on. I think we miss out on them most of the time uh, in the discussions, but having done work on the ground and speaking to a lot of youth um, in food systems, a um, lot of youth are moving away because they don't want to be impacted by the climate and disaster risks. And, and this creates a big issue in developing countries because youth moving away from sectors because they do not want to face the risks that the parents are facing would create bigger risks. So. It's important that we look at youth, build their capacity, and also make sure that to engage them in this venture and see how they could contribute to the process as well. And I will be in the venue in the evening, hopefully today. And I look forward to engaging with all of you in the coming days as well. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Smith. And uh, that important note around uh, uh, more and more uh, inclusion. Uh, Sophie, over to you. So um, my colleagues before me have, have done an excellent summary of what I was going to say. So I, my last comment will be that the, um, the center is moving into its next phase. We're actively looking to finance um, the evidence base and close the, close the protection gap as many of us align to. So please be in touch. Um, my colleagues are online. Um, I'm also in here for the next two weeks. So looking forward to the start of a conversation about building more evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Sanga. Be in touch. No, you took my <laughs> take-home message. So, no, uh, I mean, with all these uh, framework documents, it's actually that each individual actor has to unpack the topic and theme um, for itself. And um, of course, we want to be of help. Um, so, uh, in the function of the co-chairing the um, uh, impact working group, definitely, uh, we are open for a conversation in the coming days, but also, quite frankly, months, um, to actually see what it means for the individual actor and uh, also see how this uh, topic can be unpacked. We definitely will come to the Program Alliance to ask them and other actors. Uh, just uh, stay tuned and uh, yeah, an open, open invitation uh, for a dialogue. Oh, that's, uh, that's a great way to end. Thank you, Sonka. I have, uh, I have three or four thank yous to give before we close. Uh, the first is, of course, to all the panelists, uh, both real and virtually real. Great to have you with us. And thank you for uh, managing the technology risks Big thank you to Swenya for guiding us through the roadmap. And uh, we're all going to jump on board. Thank you, Swenya, for, for, uh, for being here and, and, uh, uh, and supporting this event. Big thank you to the technical team who have managed things remarkably in the first day here uh, together in the Resilience Hub. But a final thank you to Dr. Flaxbach. No, a very important thank you on behalf of us all, not just for being here today, but for all that you've done to move this agenda forward in three years. Uh, we wish you very well in your next chapter. And I am sure this will not be your last COP. I am sure we will see you in Egypt and wherever else, maybe not in quite the same capacity, but please, Dr. Flaxbuck, you will always be a member of this community, and we look forward to uh, uh, you being with us on the journey ahead. Thank you so much.